All right, hello friends. Some of you are catching on, some of you are catching up. Good to have you here. Uh, Facebook, we don't quite have you. Now, Facebook friends. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, my camera is doing strange things today. I promise I didn't do anything <laughs> different from yesterday. And I've restarted both devices twice, so we're just hoping for the best here. Uh, and already getting bad, getting bad news. All right, you YouTube people, we'll go, we'll go on with the show. We we might not have our. We, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, we might not have our Facebook friends at all. Uh, I'm. I'm using two cameras. One works well, one doesn't. I'm in the market for... Um, I'm in the market for a new camera. Uh, anyway, that's not what you joined me to hear from, hear about. <laughs> this is Daily Art Adventure number 895, day two, on a German Shepherd portrait. Started this yesterday. Welcome, welcome to all of you. Hello, Bruno. Bruno, nice to have you with us here. And I'm going to give I'm going to give our going to give our f Facebook people one more chance. All right. So here's the good news. On a, on a second day, on a day two of of any painting, assuming assuming that the day one is dry, um, then um, I get to do whatever colors I want. So here's here's the rule. Mm -mm -mm. Again, Facebook people, I'm sorry, very bad connection. Must be. I don't know what the problem is. Sorry, I'm doing exactly what I've done for the last several days. Anyway, here's the rule. When uh, when it's time to do a glaze on a dry painting. So this is all dry not cured but it's all dry day two on a on a dry painting is I get to glaze it and I require my students to say I like it pretty much many of them choke on that you have to say I like it pretty much um, we just lost our Facebook again this is my last try I like it pretty much I just wish it was more blank, whatever the blank is, right? I like it pretty much. I wish this background were more richer, more yellow. Wish the sky was more blue. And so when I say more yellow here, I actually could also mean more green. I'm going to start with yellow. Okay, that's, that's done. I'm going to do a little bit more yellow, this time with some green on my brushes. And let's have, well, we got green. Let's do green on the trees as well. And once again, you see how I allow a little bit of the green to bleed over into the subject matter, whatever it, whatever that may be. Likewise, green up into the sky. I'm going to clean these brushes really quickly. <coughs> and uh, hello, Barbara. Welcome. You, you, do I remember you doing pet pet images, Barbara? I'm not sure. Sounds like something. <laughs> I was going to say, sounds like something you might do. But that sounds, that's risky to say that about some other artist, so I won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle 60 has done, just, just did a, and a number of other people told me yesterday they were just, they were, had just finished or about to do or in the middle of doing animal portraits of various sorts. So maybe that's where I'm getting that impression from. Let's zoom in here a little bit so you can kind of see what's going on. I've got some um, purple violet on my brushes. I 
back into vignette the, those corners a little bit more. I'm going to do some oxide red down there as well. Oxide red and violet, purple dioxazine violet make a really nice dark neutral gray. Okay, now I guess I don't have to clean my brushes since I just did some brown because I want to do just a little bit of warming up on Sheba's fate. So this is my good friend Gif, his parents, dog. This is a surprise, I believe, for the mom, Gif's mother. Okay, so I just did a, a mixture of browns, brown, yellow, orange, it doesn't really matter. So I just, that, that is what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to warm up and enrich in these colors just a little bit. Okay, so that's done. Oh, one more little, little tiny bit. I don't usually do real small details in um, when I'm glazing, but I'm making an exception here. Yeah, get that yellow uh, butterfly. But now, hang on, now that I've done that, oh wait, go, I, now I realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, that's too much, too much of a good thing. I was going to say I can warm up the, the green in the grass a little bit more. Okay, and, and again, <laughs> I don't usually do this, making another exception. I don't usually do, again, small bits, but this is a fairly small painting, so I'm going to do uh, red on the barn. Ooh, that's a nice red now. It was kind of a sickly pink <laughs> before now, but now it's lovely. Nothing sick about it. Lovely. Give me just a moment while I swish these three brushes quickly. All right, now, after glazing, I very often... Whoops, I just gave you guys a kick. Sorry about that. Get you straight back up. There we go. Um, you know, often do a, a little bit of lifting. For, for a little bit of light area. All right, and I think I'm going to start up here with the sky. Let me get that. So I just did a mid-tone, not very, not very heavy, not very much, but a mid-tone uh, blue on the sky. Just intensified the color a little bit, which I am quite happy with. Now I'm mixing up some brown oxide red that is an indigo blue i don't usually have any indigo blue on my palette but for some reason i put some up the other day i don't remember why now but it's a nice dark blue kind of a warm blue greenish but very dark and i don't want this to be i'm trying to mix up a a a gray. This is for the the gray side, the, the cloudy side, the cloudy side, the cloudy side of these clouds. That makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> the dark side, the underside of the some of these clouds. Right, and then I can probably just get by with a, a little wiping off. Hello, Barbara Plesia over there on Facebook. Barbara, I hope the I hope you find the stream satisfactory. It's been in and out this morning, strangely, even though 
Ah, Barbara, I was right. So you do a lot of pet portraits. Good for you. Feel free to send me some tips. Um, so next, what I'm, the process I'm following here in the sky, by the way, is a process that I do often, often, often. Anytime you're doing a highly variegated, you know, modeled light shade surface, which is everything in this painting. It's the sky, the dog's fur, fur and face, uh, the trees in the background, and the grass, it all follows this pattern. Um, so my, pat, my practice is uh, is uh, mid-tone over the entire surface. That's what you saw me do with a blue glaze. Then dark details, which dark in this case is relative because it's the dark side of clouds. So I did that next. That's the, the gray that I just put just put down there. And then finally, uh, light. So that's the practice. Mid, mid tones over everything, dark details, light details in that order. The order is what's important there. There's all kinds of other ways to paint, of course, but if you want to the right way. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit arrogant, snooty statement there. Start with, the, start with a, a good rule of thumb and then modify it as you, as you become experienced and as you become comfortable. But it's nice to have a, often a formula like when in doubt, do this kind of thing. And then as you grow in whatever, a dozen different ways, feel, of course, you can modify it. You can, you're welcome to grow up and say, you know, Dan Nelson used to say this, but <laughs> you can say that if once you've, so to speak, once you've mastered my technique, quote, I'm being a little pompous here. Once you've mastered the right way, again, I'm being a little pompous there, just a little. As long as I know I'm being pompous, it doesn't matter so much, right? <laughs> as long as I know I'm being arrogant. Anyway, once you've mastered, again, what I'm calling the right way, then of course, of course, of course, you, you're welcome to branch out and do whatever you want. Not that, I, not that you're not welcome to branch out. To, anyway, never mind. My caveats are piling up. I'm having a caveat crash. I'm making so many caveats, they're crashing up on top of each other. So we'll just abandon that right there. Now, having, having mentioned to you the, the, the three-step process for painting any, again, highly variegated, that means light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, mixed, busy texture that you want to look realistic. Again, the formula is mids, darks, lights, and then you're done. All right, but there's another principle that um, crashes up on top of that one, all right? So the name of my book is <laughs> Sitting on Mothballs. Oh boy, you just, you just, I, I hope I'm doing what I'm supposed to do each and every day. And if, when the day comes, I'm supposed to write that book. Right? Hope and pray that I'll just do it. All right. There's another principle. The name of the book is Breakable Laws of Painting. And how do you know when to break a law? And the answer, when there's a countervening or opposing law that overrides the earlier one. All right, so this is such a case. The rule is, the law is, mids, darks, lights. There's another practice or another principle. I usually state it this way. We're getting a little bit of static on it. Hang on just a second. Let me see if I can alleviate that. Here we go. The, the countervening or opposing rule is this. Whenever possible, never... Let me start that again. Never miss the opportunity to negative paint something, anything, no matter what it is you're painting, if there's an opportunity to negative paint it, there's now, that I'm, af I'm afraid that I and maybe other people as well c confuse these two terms. They're two, 
the word negative paint can sort of mean two things. One, it means to don't paint the object, paint around it, which is the way I'm using it right now. Another way that it's used is negative paint, which means remove, pick up a rag or something and remove paint from the canvas. That's also called negative painting. So forgive me for the confusion there, but in this case, I'm using the term whenever you have the opportunity, whenever you can create the opportunity, look for excuses to negative paint things. That is by not painting the thing, but by painting what's behind them or, or around it. Okay, and that, I use that, apply that principle to all kinds of situations. Well, here's one. Okay, I think my sky is just about finished, but I've got one more step. And it is always be looking for an excuse to negative paint. What that means is instead of painting th things, paint around them. So the things, quote unquote, up here in the sky are the clouds. The, the blue sky, as you all know, is behind the clouds, right? If there's no clouds, the sky's all blue and the clouds are in front of the blueness, right? So that means I've set up a perfect opportunity, if you will, to negative paint these clouds. So this principle is smashing up against the earlier, the earlier principle was mid dark light, right? Did that. But then there's another principle that's in a sense opposed to that or in, really in addition to it, which is whenever possible, look for excuses to negative paint objects. So now I'm gonna paint the clouds, not by painting the clouds, but in fact by painting the blue behind them and boy we keep now it, 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 this is a very simple application of this principle this neg negative reverse painting or negative painting an object um, since I'm on it though I guess I'll explain a little bit why how come how come how come why why there are reasons for all these rules sometimes I feel like I have the energy to dis to get into it other times. So I do have the energy <laughs> for this one today. Why? Why does it look, okay, be, okay, the answer to every question is because it makes it a better painting. Okay, that's the universal answer to every question. But Okay, but why does it make it a better painting? Okay, here's why. Um, the viewer, the viewer's subconscious mind. Now, I don't expect non-artists to see this, explain this, process any of this out loud. You understand? So there's many, many things we do as almost everything we do as an artist we're doing um, to impact the viewer subconsciously. The, the viewer will not be aware of how he or she is being manipulated, so to speak, quote unquote, manipulated. All right. So I don't expect that anybody, any non-artist to see this, but why is it effective? Why is it beautiful, I'll use that word, to negative paint an object? The reason is the viewer subconsciously intuits, picks up, their eye note picks up, that this blue paint, this light blue paint that I'm doing right now, this sky color, sky blue paint, was painted last on top of the clouds. Okay, now, again, I don't expect them to process this on a conscious level. A good artist could, would process it on a conscious level, but a non-artist would never have a clue, but that doesn't matter. That's, we're, that's, we're achieving our objective by impacting them without them knowing. Um, so they intuit that this blue paint is actually laying on top of, it's the last layer I've done up here. It's laying on top of these clouds, but their, their intelligent side of their brain knows that all clouds are in front of the blue sky. Let me say it this way, blue far away, clouds up close. But when you follow this last practice, you reverse it, you put the blue paint close and the cloud paint farther away. So it creates, and it's a little bit hard to explain, 
but it creates a little momentary, I like to call it a momentary wiggle of confusion in the mind of the viewer. And normally, human beings don't like to be confused, right? Just like normally, human beings don't like to be manipulated. That pretty much goes without saying. Except in the realm of visual art, in fact, we do. Almost all, almost all the true aesthetic pleasure we, nah, that's putting it too strongly, most <laughs> of the aesthetic pleasure we derive from um, visual art is from being tricked or fooled, if you will. And uh, that sounds so counterintuitive, I can just imagine somebody arguing with me about that. But show me your artwork. If you're way better than I am, I will consider your opinion, but, and then I'll reject it. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, I understand much of what I'm saying is so counterintuitive, that's why I have to say it. If it, were, if it were intuitive, I wouldn't have to say it. Okay? So anyway, much of the pleasure that, that, that the hu human mind, the human eye it receives, experiences in visual art is in fact from being manipulated and even fooled or tricked. Again, so counterintuitive. Again, that's why I have to say it, because it's counterintuitive. If I were to say something like human beings derive aesthetic pleasure, this is true too, human beings derive aesthetic pleasure from seeing a thing, in this case we'll just say a dog, a German Shepherd head, reasonably accurately rendered on a two-dimensional surface. And indeed, that's a true statement. Human beings get a kick out of seeing stuff. You know, the, 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 the kick, the, the little buzz that you got when you were in third grade and little Susie down the row from you or little Johnny <laughs> down the row from you could draw, Johnny could draw a really cool race car or gun and little Susie could draw a pretty cool pony or unicorn. Okay, in third grade, that gave you a little aesthetic buzz, like, wow, look at, look at, you said to your friends, come over here. Unless you were like me, you were the, you were the Susie or Johnny down the row, right? Be that as it may, whoever it is, the, 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 their fellow students derive pleasure, got a kick out of it, so to speak, saying, wow, look at, Johnny can really draw a cool gun. <laughs> Susie can really draw a cool gun. Horse, wow, Susie is so good at drawing. I sound like I'm mocking. I'm not mocking. This is this literal truth. Our brain, we do derive a, a degree of aesthetic pleasure from that. I should probably point out that <clears throat> everybody does, so to speak, unless, unless, unless you have uh, an art degree, especially a, a Master of Fine Arts degree then all of that pleasure, all of that childlike innocence has been beat the heck out of you and you do not receive pleasure anymore. Uh, but that, that is a perverted state of the human whatever animal. That is not the natural. That, that, is, that, is, that is, and I know where I speak, believe me. Came, you know, I came out of that culture, came way out of that culture. I always fit in it very, in a very awkward manner. Uh, didn't understand my own awkwardness when I was a 20-something year old student, like I understand it now. But anyway, all right, let's get off, let's get off the, that heavy, heavy philosophical art history topic. I don't feel like doing any more of that right now. <laughs> And uh, let's continue. I'm, as you can maybe tell, I'm hoping to kind of finish up these trees here in the next few minutes. So I'm mixing up over here a pale, pale blue, a little bit of a dirty blue, not real clean. It has a little bit of other stuff in it. So that I can paint. Whoa, that's too bright light. Too light, too bright. 
Let's darken that up. Okay, what I'm doing right now, these are traditionally called sky holes. They should not be called sky holes, as if you're a regular follower of mine, you know. They should be called tree holes. Hello, Grady and Terry. Good to hear from you. Hello, Don't Care. <laughs> Hello, Light Blue. Um, I'm painting now the sky behind the tree. So that's why it's traditionally called sky holes is because so many times it is in fact the sky that's behind the tree. But I paint more cityscapes than any other thing. And so for me, very, very, very often, it's not the sky behind a tree, it's a building, in which case they should be called building holes, at which point the absurdity of calling them sky holes becomes manifest. So anyway, they should be called tree holes. Um, whatever you call them, a few minutes ago I was talking about the charm, the beauty of painting the faraway object with close-up paint. In other words, this blue sky, blue sky is farther than the clouds, but the blue that I paint on there is closer. And uh, this sky holes, traditionally called sky holes, is the most, by far, the most traditional and common application of that principle. Okay, because everybody knows that the clouds, the light clouds, are behind the dark trees, right? There's no confusion in your mind, right? You all know, yes you do. <laughs> all I'm saying the trees are up close and the, the clouds, the sky is farther away. All right, but I am now painting the sky color on top of the tree color. Again, creating that little momentary flicker, wiggle of confusion in the viewer's brain that is then experienced as pleasure. It's, if I could act out it sort of in slow motion, it happens, I think, in a, in a second, but in slow motion it would be kind of like, Oh, look at holes in the trees. Oh, look at the holes were painted on top of the trees. Now, isn't that charming? You know, the verbiage doesn't have to be exactly like that, but that's a little bit of what goes on in the, in the mind of the viewer without the, the viewer doesn't have to process those words at all. That's just what goes on without them being aware of it. Let me go back to something I said just a few minutes ago just to reiterate and re-emphasize. In the realm of visual arts, now it, this may also be true in other arts, I'm not even going to go that, so it may not be limited, but in the realm of visual arts, the, the artist who manipulates the viewer the most skillfully, well the most, first of all, the artist who manipulates the viewer the most and the most skillfully is the artist that we generally, as human beings, regard to be the best artist. Now that sound, that's, again, that's so counterintuitive. It's so counterintuitive I can imagine some people coming back with comments saying, I don't think that's true. Well, <laughs> if today's the first day you heard about it, then you have no right to start arguing with me. Chew on it for about 15 years, then come back and argue with me then and show me your fantastic painting. I'm sorry, I'm being really snobby now. It is a little bit amazing, though, how many times people who are mediocre painters, art, artists, uh, consider themselves worthy of <laughs> arguing. It's just all part of putting oneself out there, as I am. The world is full, full, tragically, of trollish characters and personalities. People who see no problem with being completely ignoramuses about a subject, but more than willing to correct people who are are their superior in any given field. <laughs> now, I, for instance, I would never dream of critiquing a major league baseball player or a, a professional golfer. I mean, that would just be absurd. I would laugh at such a notion. But evidently, not everybody shares my, 
reticence and to have no problem at all. <laughs> it's funny, okay, and I'm sounding like sour grapes and so on. I, I wasn't really feeling sour grapey at all before I said all that stuff, but it's, it is, it, it, life, life is funny. So if you want to be one of those and you're a terrible artist, but you feel yourself worthy to correct me and judge me, you just go right ahead. Have yourself a merry little troll day. <laughs> oh my goodness. I did not know that was going to come out. But I'm just about finished, as you can see, with this band of trees. Oh, by the way, I did this without... Uh, can you see all the seeds? Yeah, you can. Hello, Razia, Razia, Subhan. Thank you. And hello, Hudson Shanahan. That's a new, that's a new name. Good. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for speaking. Uh, light blue. Ooh, that's a good question. Is it good to get a degree in art? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> all right. Let me go back. Someone asked, what kind of brush? In my left hand, I don't know. This is a Treckle. I hardly even know what that means. My right hand is a, oh, a cheap pro stroke, a student grade brush. My right hand, I don't mind using student grade if it, if it works. Forgive me, I think I'm going to stand right in your way here for a second. Maybe I'll go over here on this side. Um, okay, light blue, is it a good idea to get a degree in art? No, 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 it is not. Absolutely not. Not if you want to, uh, not if you want to create Okay, so here's the, here's the dangerous and philosophically and historically loaded term, but I'm going to use it anyway. Not if you want to create beautiful art. Okay, now if you, if you want to um, express yourself, <laughs> you really need the gesture. If you want to learn how to express yourself, then by all means, get a degree in art. Okay? Um, I could, I could go on for, I have two books that I'm writing. This, this second book I've been working on for over 10 years, and it's over 400 pages long right now, but it's far from being published. And I'm still working on it. It's about, it's to explain and describe um, the, the modern art. What, again, what, using layman's terms here, not, not, not using academic terms, using what, what, normal people would call modern art. I want, I'm trying to explain that. It's neither a, what's the word when you just shriek, when you just scream at something. It's not one of those, but neither is it a love fest. It's a, my book is, if it ever sees the light of day, it's trying to be a balanced and honest and fair and actually gracious or benevolent uh, description of the of the adolescent temper tantrum that was 20th century art. Now, nothing wrong with adolescence. You have to go to, to get to adulthood from childhood. You have to go through adolescence. So I think it was necessary. I also think it's not necessary anymore. It's over. It's, it's done. It should be done, but it's not. The, the art professors have not gotten the memo. All right, now let me go back to Light Blue's question. Should you get a degree in art? Um, there are a few places... Uh, around the country, and uh, one of them is it's, it's in San Francisco, the College of Art College, Fine Arts College Design, all those words mashed together in some form in San Francisco is a good school. Um, there is the uh, Lutheran College in California that has a pretty good art department. Now I'm going to say something very, what's the word? Whew, dangerous. Okay. There are two schools that I know of, and this is a great irony. Uh, one is Southeast Baptist College in Pensacola, Florida, and the other is Liberty University. Now the irony here is, in many respects, I would, I would have difficulty no, don't don't read too much into this because I'm way more subtle than you're thinking. I'm not, I am a Christian, so I'm not anti-Christian, but in many respects, I'd be uncomfortable with many of the things in those schools. But the irony is, because of their conservative culture, 
they have the wherewithal and the disposition to resist the siren call of uh, 20th century contemporary art, okay, which is, that's an irony. Now, so because of their resistance to the siren call, the university, the, the universal and ubiquitous uh, worldview of the art establishment, because of that then, they can actually teach good art. Now, again, there's, that's, that, there's a real deep irony in that because I'm not a conservative personality. Um, I'm a, I am a creative personality. So it's unusual, a little bit unusual for me to, to say good things about institutions that are sort of by their nature conservative. Um, and again, don't read too much into that either, because I guarantee I'm an old-fashioned liberal. That's why I have virtually no truck, so to speak, to use a funny old word, with contemporary, with the prevailing uh, dominating culture of, of our universities, media, and um, entertainment industries, okay, because I'm a real conservative, not a, I mean, I'm a real liberal, I'm sorry, not a, because I believe in generosity and so on and so forth and so on and so on and so forth, but never mind, I'm getting myself in too deep. Anyway, so no, I would not do, recommend art degree unless, now here's what I would recommend. If you want to create beautiful art, then go to an atelier. A-T is spelled atelier, A-T-E-L-I-E-R, atelier. <laughs> it's a French word pronounced atelier. Uh, these have been sprouted up like mushrooms uh, in the last decade or two in the Western world. They are a strong, strong, strong reaction against the follies of the art establishment. Um, so again, if you want to express yourself, if you want to be political and even hyper-political, then all, by all means, go get an art degree. Now, if you want to teach, that's a different story. Uh, if you want to teach secondary, like high school or junior high or even elementary school art, that, that's, that's quite a different story. You may get an art degree to do those things. But if you want to paint beautifully, do not. Can, I got an art degree. It took me literally took me decades to recover from the ravages of my BFA degree, and it was from a good college, but it was not a good, not a good art department. It was a very typical, typical, typical art department. All right, I'm going on. They they definitely are bristle brushes. Yes. Thank you. I believe those are good brands. Exactly. Um, I'm just about done. I was going to point out, back to get off philosophy for a minute. Um, I, play, I did this trick that I do often. If you have a row of trees, make some of them distinctly an alternate color. And I picked, I did that one. One, two, three of these trees have a decided brownish, orange-ish cast to them. Can you see? One, two, three. I've mentioned, that's bef I've mentioned that before. That's a little trick, so to speak, that I, I learned from Thomas Kincaid. <laughs> and as you know, if you're a regular, I love saying good things about Thomas Kincaid just to watch my fellow artists have apoplectic fits and seizures. I laugh at your seizure. Okay. Because as if you're an artist, you're supposed to hate Thomas Kincaid. Okay. No, I, I don't. Um, I don't want to paint. I don't want to do the some sentimental stuff that he did, but that doesn't mean he wasn't supposed to. Okay, I would say to, to my fellow, I'd get off your high horse, and especially if you're a better painter than he is, then I'm more willing to listen to your and watch your apoplectic fit. But most, I, I've never been in a room ever, 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 ever where the person criticizing Thomas Kincaid was in fact a better painter than him. They just didn't like what he did with his skill. And I can understand that, but that doesn't give you a right to despise him. Plus, it cuts off your nose. While you were busy despising him, I would say to my, to the Kincaid detractors, while you were busy po posing in front of your fellow artist friends to show how much you despise him so that you could get into the cool kids club, I was busy learning things from him. And I'm a better artist because of that. 
doesn't mean I'm better than you are, but it does mean I'm better than I was because I took notes and there I just gave you one right there. Just a little trick, little tiny, tiny little trick that I picked up from this man who indeed did things with his skill that I, I, don't, I don't want to do, but again, doesn't mean he wasn't supposed to. Whatever level of supposed to you want to think. Hey, let me talk for a minute. Do you see this sort of red blush right here? Likewise, there's some red up there in the clouds. There's another swipe of red. Now that one probably came from the barn. This one over here is nothing other than uh, part of my original abstract painting. Same thing here. There's a little, little bit of purple and red right there. Um, those are marks that are still barely showing through from the very, very, very beginning of uh, my painting, which was throwing down that crazy abstract stuff. Now, I don't know how much of that red is going to show through, but some of it for sure. I'm this far along and I'm in no hurry to blot it out or cover it up. I might, I'm diminishing it slightly right now, as you can see. But um, that's part of that's a good example. Why do I do that crazy abstract stuff? Of course, the answer is the, the, the one size fits all answer because it makes it a better painting. Now, the next question is why, but why does it make it a better painting? And usually I do have an answer to those questions. Sometimes I have the energy to speak them and sometimes I just don't have the energy because I repeat all this stuff. <laughs> I repeat my recent tirade that I just gave about the art establishment uh, education, the university I, that I, you know, I don't know, how, every how many months does that, does that come around? I, I don't know, but it comes around every, every so often. So if you keep following me, no doubt it will come around again. If you want to do beautiful paintings, see the 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 art established, the, and and again, I understand you know I understand the history better than most people, and frankly, I believe better than most art his, history most not all most art history professors. Um, they are art history professors because not only did they study, but they actually bought the they bought the party line, and they kind of liked it, so that's why they became art history professors. And uh, I feel like my orientation actually makes me, I understand art history and, and don't agree with much of what I was taught. I have a book on my shelf, on my bed table, not on my shelf, on my bed table right now that I'm going through slowly. It's called, What Are You Looking At? Uh, I've, in the course of writing my book that's 400 pages long right now, I've, I've bought scores of art history books and this this one is no exception I thought it might be I thought it might be an interesting twist on the art of the 20th century but after two chapters in it, it is not an interesting twist it's same old same old and basically here's the most about let me ramble about art history for just a minute here's the most typical traditional approach to to understanding and teaching art history it goes something like this well you know art was chugging along in the 1800s and Artists painted beautiful and realistic paintings. And then, starting in about 1890, um, the first explosion, this is, would be one way to tell the story, the first explosion would be uh, Impressionism. And then a whole bunch of other isms came along. And if you just understand how each one followed the one before, then you understand art history. And that's typically how it's told. And that the book is called What Are You Looking At? That's exactly, he just says, he just sort of turns the whole thing sort of like into a quiz show. It says if you just understand what each school, art school was trying to do in response and reaction to the one before it, then you will understand art. Now there's a huge fallacy in that, logical fallacy in that, but that is how I would think 99% of college art history courses are taught. If you simply understand the flow, if you understand how one thing led to another, to another, to another, what they were doing, what they said, and why they said it, then you understand art and art history. And I couldn't disagree more 
Again, it doesn't mean I'm right. I'm not so arrogant to think I'm right about everything, but I have strong opinions on the subject, and they are not based on a whole lot of ignorance. There may be some, of course. I'm willing to admit I might be wrong. But anyway, I don't think that that answers the question at all. The, the, the question, my question is the underlying why, why, why? Why did they do this? Why did they go and why did the Fauvists, F-A-U-V-I-S, why? I know who they were, what they did, and what they said, but uh, most people do things for reasons they don't know, they themselves do not understand. Why did the Fovis want to be wild animals? See, there was a, a underlying, and I'm not going to answer that question right now. I'm just saying that is the question. Why did the Fovis, which means, or Dada, why did the Dada movement, why did they want to be like baby talk? What does Dada mean? It actually means Dada, Dada, Goo Goo, Dada, Goo Goo. Why did they feel that absurdity uh, was, you know, the order of the day? Because there are, there are answers to that question, and they lie in the realm of history and philosophy, not, not art history, history history. Anyway, all right, that's probably enough of that. So, um, <laughs> too much of that, no doubt. But I've got... <laughs> But I'm going to say something while I paint, and doggone it, an occasional foray into uh, philo philosophy and history, which is some peop uh, people I will also often get see, you know, you're a good painter, you should stick to painting, stop the philosophy. Well, I beg to differ. Um, my actual core identity, and I might be wrong about this, of course, of course, everybody, you better admit you could be wrong. So I admit I might be wrong, but I believe that my core identity is more, lies more in the realm of philosophy and history than it does art. Art is something I do. I'm good at it, but it's something I do. Uh, being a philosopher slash historian, so to speak, is something I am. Now, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, because I, I just heard, in my mind, I just heard somebody, you know, like U Cal Berkeley or something, who is an art, who is a philosophy major. They just rolled their eyes and gagged and so on and so forth. And believe me, I, and, yep, I, know, what they're, I know what they would say in response to that. But, once again, <laughs> uh, I reject their assessment. All right, <laughs> I'm all over, all over the map, aren't I? But while I'm talking about this, I'm painting grass, right? Did you notice I was painting grass? <laughs> this is very close. I don't know if it's all done, but it's very close to done. Um, while I'm working on things far away, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and take care of that red barn back there. Now here, uh, here's a, a very special artistic challenge. Oh, you guys can't see the photograph, can you? Okay. Hang on, let me pick it up for a second. So there's the photograph. All right, hang on. There you go. There's the photograph. Hello, Donna Nipper. And um, so there's the background. Now, actually, this is this whole photograph is a composite. The dog is made up of three images, I believe, and the background is a completely separate image. But in fact, the original dog was sitting in front of this this yard, this field, just not this picture of this field. Does that make sense to you? Anyway, so there's the picture, and of course, it would be a grave error to paint that. That's way too stark, way too forward. So. But I want it to look like, you can already tell that I'm not going to, right? You can already tell that I bet he's not going to paint that the way the photograph is correct. <laughs> just, just for fun, and since I opened the can of let me go back to the subject of being an art major in college. Again, here's, here's one of the, I, I do, in my book, I go through periods of humor and kind of poking fun, so to speak. Here's one of my fun pokes at, at the, art, the art establishment culture. Um, if you go to essentially any university in the Western world, Europe or America, and, and major in art, Let's just imagine you zip all the way through your four years of college, which amounts to about two and a half years of being an art major, right? And the rest is maybe general. Um, and then at, if, 
you have a, a senior show or a thesis show. Now this is multiplied several times over if, if you in fact get an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts degree. You really, really have to drink the Kool-Aid to get an MFA. So I consider people with MFAs to be the most, unless they come from the, uh, 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 one of the few schools like College of Art and Design San Francisco. I for, forgive me, I should look it up. There is, there's a few schools out there that actually teach painting. Anyway, so um, let's just imagine that you're, let's, let's dial back to a BFA. And at the end of that time, you're, you're going to have a show, right? That's part of your graduation process. Instead of exams, you have a show and you do, you display, who knows, 15, 20, 30, let's say paintings. Let's say you're a painting major, okay? You could be sculptor, printmaking, ceramic. Whoops, 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 I lost you there. Sorry about that. Um, but let's just say you're a painter. So at, at, for your senior show, you display 15, 20, 25, 30 paintings in the college galleries, let's say. And uh, in that show, you're expected to show your work, but more important than your work, you're expected to show your thinking, your process, your philosophy, your development. And um, again, especially if you're getting an MFA, but even if you're getting a BFA, um, your work is expect, you will be rewarded most vociferously, I'll use a funny word, if, if the theme of your show, now if your work is simply visual, you will be, hmm, misunderstood and glossed over. But if your show has a lot of political statement or a lot of personal psychological anguish, like you tell people that come to your show, you want them to know how terrible your childhood was being raised by a single mother and a dysfunctional father. And, uh, and, and if, God help you, if you're in poverty, raised in poverty, that, the, all these will redound to your uh, great reception and, and, and praise, if I can use that term, on, from, from your, your fellow students and from your professors and so forth. The more, the more angsty you can be in your show, the better. But let's, let's just back it off and say, okay, let's get away from the personal dysfunctional of your upbringing and so on and so forth, all of which will give you great points in the, in the eyes, again, of the art department. But let's just say your, your personal, your middle-class kid and your upbringing was really not that terrible. I mean, you know, everybody has their issues, but on the whole, wasn't, you know, you had a roof over your head and parents who loved you in spite of all their dysfunctionalities. Um, in that case, then you, 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 you'd better choose a um, political statement to be what your show is about. And, and, and so, now not just any political statement, like <laughs> God help you, for instance, just to be funny, God help you if you ever breathed of like you like that you like Donald Trump or something that would not be accepted. That would you'd be you would be I, I mean you couldn't even survive. You'd be you'd be roundly ridiculed and, and oh you would just be anyway. So it has to be a political statement of a certain type and and you know orientation. Um, I went for decades not really knowing that this orientation had a very specific name. I, I now know the name and I'm not going to tell it to you right now, but if I used it, you go, oh yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, here's the funny part. At that same university where you were majoring in art and becoming a world-renowned expert on all things philosophical and political, Across campus, there were actually students who were actually majoring in political science and history and philosophy. And now they have their own issues, but in order to get degrees in those subjects, they actually had to read some philosophy. Oh, hang on, my buddy Doug is here. Hey man, come on in. I am, I am, is the garage door open? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, so task number one might be carrying the pegboard up there. I don't, I don't know if you, can you do that by yourself? I don't know if you can or not. That would be nice. 
because I'm right in the middle. Um, where was I? Hang on just a second. Oh yeah, so across campus there are students who are actually studying, let's say, political history and philosophy. And they actually had to read big fat books in order to, you know, pass their tests and get degrees in those subjects. Well, lo and behold, the art major can become not only just as much a recognized expert on all those subjects, but in fact a more recognized expert on all those subjects without ever cracking one single book on the subject. <laughs> I could multiply that times whatever. And, uh, yep, anyway, so that's just, that's just, just quite interesting when you think about it. Uh, artists, it's, it's a very much like the way Hollywood uh, movie stars now are, are free to express their opinions on any subject, especially the more serious and the more deep it is. And, and they're followed with adulation and praise and reverence and obedience and so on if, if they express the correct given uh, opinion on any of those subjects. <laughs> Doesn't matter if they've ever read a book on history, philosophy, or <laughs> simply by the virtue of the fact that they have a pretty face and are famous from movies gives them authority to be, and it's very much the same way as for art majors. Art majors don't have to study anything whatsoever simply because of the virtue of the fact that they are an artist. They're regarded by the general culture to be experts on all these subjects. You might hear a little bit of what's the word in my, in my voice. I think that is preposterous beyond description, but that's the world we live in. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, good. Maybe you can get started on electrical. Thanks. Pardon? Me? The skill saw? I th I think so. All right. So there. That was a crazy rant, wasn't it? But these are some things some of you who are not art majors you don't understand that. <laughs> If you want to be regarded as an expert on any subject whatsoever, you don't have to study that subject at all. All you need to do is to be an artist and you're instantly, now not if you have the wrong opinions <laughs> on those subjects, wrong quote unquote, you understand? So, you, <laughs> all right, I'm afraid I'm, I'm tipping my hand a lot more than I intend to here. I usually try to keep my, I'd rather keep you guessing, but I'm afraid that you're probably not guessing very much here. But just the irony, that's an irony, isn't it? You want to be an expert? Don't study anything, just become an artist and you're re universally regarded as being an expert on all thing, everything. <laughs> all right. Whew. Well, that, I hope you feel better. <laughs> I'm going to change my mind here and change this tree over here. I'm standing right in your way, I know, forgive me. Because this, this tree is on this side of the barn, so it makes it go taller because of perspective. Let me do some quick sky holes behind that tree. And I'm sorry if I triggered some of you. I mean, Uh, <laughs> I am ranting, you bet. I was ranting for a while there. You new people, we, that's just part of the price of watching Dan Nelson paint every once in a while. You have to put up with a rant. <laughs> you know, I actually had the opportunity a couple, a couple years ago where I sat around a, in a living room with old friends of ours, like old 20, 30 year old friends. That is, we'd been friends for 20, 30, 30 years. And um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, what, what kind of group? A smart group, pretty smart group. Um, uh, almost everybody has a master's degree or more. Um, everybody in the group, except my wife and I, no, two people, two couples, maybe three. So we're talking like 10 couples. Seven, eight of the ten have written are published authors, and several of them multi-published authors. So that's the kind of group. And I, I took it was my turn to talk on a Saturday evening, so I 
I basically described to them what I just described to you guys, sort of uh, explaining the art world to uh, a room full of non-artists, the, the contemporary art world. And <laughs> these were all well-educated people, and the overall response was astonishment. Um, they literally had no idea. They had literally had no idea about the, the, what I've just described to you guys as the realities of the art world. And I was quite, I was actually quite surprised because I, I, knew, I knew that, you know, it's a rather esoteric field. Most people have no idea what goes on in the art department of your local university. But I was a little surprised that this group really had as little savvy as they did about But that, so that's, that's why I say I'd, most people have no, no idea what goes on in the art department, again, of your local university. So that's part of the reason for my rant, is just, just for fun to <laughs> help expand your horizons a little bit. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm mostly done with the background. Let's start talking about Sheba. And you know what? GIF, I printed off all those wonderful, not all of them, I, <laughs> my goodness. I printed off uh, excerpts of all those photographs and left them up, left the printer printing and promptly ran downstairs and left them all up there. Um, well, let me, I'll do a little bit of painting on Sheba's face. I'm not promising and I've, I've got my, my, helper worker assistant man here is to here to help us build some more storage in the attic so I, I need to bounce off here in a bit and get him squared away but let me go ahead and at least demonstrate what is my normal painting process um, so on day two typically day two of any painting I do what you saw me do a few of you at the beginning which is glaze, transparent glaze over the whole surface. Step two is dark details, which is redundant because it's a repeat from yesterday, right? Because yesterday I did a, a, a stage, a phase of dark details. So there you go. I made this point yesterday quite emphatically, and I'll just repeat it briefly, that if you want to sort of have a handle on my approach to painting, the, appro the, the approaches, the description is layer upon layer upon layer or phase by phase, stage by stage. It's n nothing is painted in my world all at once. It's, it emerges slowly, little by little by little, and that's why my finished paintings I'll, uh, have the look that they do, be that good or bad. I'm not, I'm not being arrogant. I'm just saying that's, that's the distinctive that's what gives them their, when people say, so I could, you know, I walked in, I looked across the room and I could tell it was a Dan Elster. So that's, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just being myself. But uh, that's what, that's the, that and the issue of transparency. Those two things are what give my paintings to look. It's layer upon layer upon layer. It's hard to say that word fast. Layer, layer, layer. <laughs> and and uh, transparent, those two issues. So. The dark details I'm doing now, uh, you, you, one might say, well, I thought you did dark details, details yesterday. Bingo, good job. Yes, I did, correct. Um, but the dark details, mm -hmm, that's exciting. The dark details I'm doing today are, um, you know, making yesterday's dark details slightly more precise, slightly richer, if you will. Uh, slightly more accurate. See, I'm, you can tell by the way I'm holding the brush here using this horrible death control grip, which I don't normally do. Right? There we go. All of a sudden, Sheba's eyes just took a little 
and they're not done yet because I'm going to come back with light details. Again, a repetition of what I did yesterday. Yesterday I did dark stuff, then light stuff. And here again, today I'm doing dark stuff and light stuff. But today's darks are slightly more accurate, precise, slightly more precise than yesterday's darks. notch in this ear right here that I missed yesterday so I'm glad I'm getting it when I when I switch over to light details here in a little while I, I'm seeing there are even more there are even more details uh, now when I say detail um, I don't mean um, Sort of like in the internet sense of the word, like getting out a one haired brush and painting one hair at a time. That that's <laughs> let me be overly blunt. That's dysfunctional detail. All right. It's okay. We 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 get we human beings derive a certain pleasure, I've already said, out of seeing something accurately rendered. So there is there is a sense in which that kind of detail is pleasing to a part of our brain. It's pleasing to the industrial side of our brain, if I may coin, coin a term. Not the first time I've used it, but. Uh, so when I say detail, again, I, it does not mean one haired brush and painting each and every hair on Sheba's face. That would be One word I might use for that is that's pedantic, and and doesn't tickle our brain. It, it tickles a part of us. Again, there's a re, there's a we are we are impressed by the industry of that kind of work. It's like wow, look how much work they did. And that's what I mean by industry. We're impressed by the industry of that kind of work, but it it's not the not a very deep uh, aesthetic buzz. If you'll let me use again use that term. By detail, I mean the impression of fur, the impression, the correct impression of color, uh, and so on. Detail is a much broader term, not simply individual hairs. I'm saying that because, again, because I'm painting a, an animal. If it were a human being, it would, again, it would not be every detail would not mean every uh, pore in the skin. That is, a, that is a, a way to paint. And every once in a while, as you may know if you follow me at all, every once in a while I really do enjoy doing a bit of pretty realistic stuff. I, anyway, that's, so I, don't, I don't do impressionistic because I am unable because I find myself incapable of it. Quite the opposite. I spent most of my adult life doing, as an illustrator, doing realistic, quite realistic stuff. Again, you can still see that on my website, danelsonart.com. Go to the illustrations and maybe you could go to airbrush would be a one category. One of the traditional mediums for uh, extreme realism. And it was fun. It is, and it is still fun a little bit. But, but uh, it's not the greatest. It's not that which produces the greatest aesthetic response in the minds of the viewer. So I do. I do get a kick out of this, looking like a German Shepherd, and even more looking like Sheba, a particular German Shepherd. Okay, let's let's be clear here, and you can tell that I'm working pretty hard to make it, quote unquote, what most people call realistic, right? Correct, and I make no apology for that. But there is a, a, there is a higher value at work here than similitude or realism or accuracy. And that higher value is line, shape, design, value, texture, 
in this case with the brush strokes texture would be the, the the most important of those words now she looks pretty good she's a, she's a little bit too dark see that's because I just finished a dark layer and I'm going to pause right there um, I'm not sure I might paint for a while without your company I'm not sure we'll see but I, I need to my time is not always my own as I said I need got work going on in the attic so uh, if you have hit the the bell you YouTube people if you've hit the bell then when I start broadcasting again you'll be notified um, but the painting as I hope you can see is 97 percent finished um, highlights on Sheba's face a little bit a little bit of brighter orange in her eyes is one of the things that needs to be done and then lighter lighter brown let me show you the photograph again see this light stuff here and on top of her nose and of course the stick I haven't even tried to describe yet but little bits of highlight and of course the butterfly is, is falling way behind everything else um, this is a real photograph by the way uh, Sheba really was holding a stick in her mouth and the butterfly really did land on the stick it's not a that part is not photo, is not photoshop that, that's real all right it's been wild and crazy I've got a lot of good rants out of my system this morning <laughs> I hope you found them informative <coughs> possibly inspiring and I hope not irritating <laughs> that's the risk <laughs> That's the risk we take around here with Daily Art Adventure. <laughs> Hello, Dick Hilliard. Oh, my goodness. Nice to have you on board. Just in time for me to leave you. And Michael McEwen, good to have you as well. Um, bye. I hope to broadcast again in a little while. Bye-bye.